Uh, so uh, we have time for questions. I'm going to ask the first question. I'm very interested in learning more about the distribution uh, system and the, the funding for distributing the warmers. I can talk about that a bit. So um, we have different partners that we work with to do distribution. Um, we do private distributions directly to small clinics in, in small towns and, and villages. Um, we work with government hospitals as well. Um, this is primarily in India. So India is our home base, but we're doing small pilots in other countries. And then we work with NGO partners. So these are both local and international NGOs that are really uh, able to reach the, the poorest of, of the poor. Um, lastly, we work with institutional partners. So GE Healthcare is one of our biggest partners. There are global distributors um, and we're forming partnerships with other partners like that uh, such as Novartis for example um, and the way the funding works we have a mixed model so uh, as was said earlier we have a for-profit and non-profit that sit side by side the nonprofit takes philanthropic donations to give away these products to the poorest communities, and that happens exclusively through our NGO partners. Um, and alongside that, we provide education. So hypothermia and temperature regulation is only one aspect of infant mortality. Um, there are other important things like nutrition, you know, breastfeeding, uh, how do you manage diarrhea. So we try to incorporate all of those educational materials into the distribution of our product. The for-profit side of Embrace manufactures the product, um, does more of the ca capital intensive activities. We sell the product to the clinics that are able to pay for it. And for every product sold on the for-profit side, a royalty payment is made to the nonprofit. So it's a way of creating a sustainable model that over the long run will not have to be dependent on donations. So we're happy to take more questions, feel free to ask. Yes, back there. You want to do this? Yeah, I can, I can answer that question. So the class is actually really interesting. Um, so it's, uh, it's called Extreme Affordability. You can look it up online. But the idea of the class is to combine the, the seven different schools of Stanford together, uh, graduate students together, to come together, um, be taught design, and then, uh, and then apply that to a social uh, cause. So to answer your first question, the, the class is pretty competitive, actually. Um, I think it's becoming more and more competitive because more and more people are interested th in this and, um, and hopefully have been inspired. Uh, but there is an application process. Uh, for me, actually, personally, um, I, I didn't get in the class originally. It's kind of a funny story. So when, I, uh, when, when it came out, when the class was offered, uh, that day I applied and I had this like Jerry Maguire moment where I was just writing like my heart, pouring my heart into why I wanted to do this class. Um, but they said, why does a computer scientist, what, what, appli like, what application or what skills can I add to, to this class because they're looking for product designers mostly or business uh, school students or medical uh, students. Um, but I, I said, you know, design can, anyone can do design. And that was the whole point of this class is that to teach that great products can be designed by anyone as long as you learn sort of the methods about it. And as, as long as you're diligent and you're passionate and you believe, you can actually um, achieve this. And so that, that is the purpose of the class is to show that, you know, Products can be designed if you follow sort of their method, and you can look this method up online. Um, so you join the class. So I, I actually called the professor, and uh, I begged him to get in, pretty much, and he let me in, uh, fortunately. But it's a very interesting class. It's no class like any other I've ever taken in, in pretty much my whole life. Like the first day, you, you prototype something. You build your ideal wallet. And so it's, very, very, uh, it's a very interesting way to think. 
and be taught. Um, but th uh, the structure sort of is that the professors are some of the, uh, from the product design uh, world, from the business world, so it's also the professors are very interdisciplinary. Um, and they come together and teach you something about how to do a business plan, or how to do an elevator pitch, or how to do um, prototyping. And so they kind of rotate around. But it's very, very uh, sort of, you, you have to kind of go in on, on your own. And, uh, and you always partner with an NGO partner. And so the project, the, the problem itself wasn't actually defined or really, uh, inter uh, or, or really planned out until we got into the class. Um, so so the, the issue uh, was presented to us uh, pretty much when we got into the class. But the, the good part is it combines a lot of these students who are very passionate about, about making positive impact in the world, which is good because you know, there's so many problems that we can tackle and it, it kind of narrows down the scope and focus. Um, and then once, once they kind of list out all the different sort of problems, you get to choose, pick and choose. And um, Jane and I were very interested in this, this, this problem once we learned, out, uh, learned more about it. So. And you, it's two quarters and yeah, it's, it's quite intensive. Add just a little bit to that, and the class really focuses on experiential learning. I think that's what makes it so fun. Everything is super hands-on. So you learn this entire design process that starts with needs finding and observation, really um, building empathy for your customers and being able to see things through their lens. And then you do rapid prototyping, testing, um, and all the way up to product launch. But so by the end of the class, you actually have this physical, tangible product that you can choose to do something with. Um, but, but prior to that, as you, uh, for example, learn about empathy, um, they take you through an exercise where you prototype a wallet for yourself. You're just given you know, construction uh, paper, bits of materials, and you, you create this wallet for yourself. And then you interview someone, and you understand what their needs are and what they would like out of a wallet, and then you make one for them. And so that teaches you that the wallet you made for yourself and the wallet you made for the other person look totally different. It's a very simple exercise, but it really drives that message home. Um, so again, everything is very, very hands-on. And in addition to the process, you also learn a lot about team dynamics. So this is probably a very Californian thing, but we had um, a design school shrink that was in the class. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that um, after each of our assignments, you would actually debrief and understand how the team worked together, learn how to give each other feedback. You know, we had sessions where we would just meditate. So maybe a little too hippie for here, but, uh, <laughs> but very fun nonetheless. <laughs> Absolutely, there is actually quite a bit of interest in this, and we're doing a study right now at um, the Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford to show that you can wean babies off of incubators and put them in our device instead. Um, neonatal intensive care unit costs are amongst the highest health care costs in the U.S., so you could actually drastically reduce those costs through products like ours. And in fact, that's something that we're thinking about as we think about future products. What are products that um, we innovate for developing countries and places with limited resources, but that we can then bring back to the US?
you want me to find what that is. There are so many different ways out there that people are already doing this that it's very hard for me to find a way to motivate and get involved in kind of starting something and engaging, like even where to put the first steps in doing that. Um, so I don't I just, uh, just kind of where, like what kind of challenges did you guys face with regards to that? What kind of advice that you would have for just going out and starting along that as opposed to sort of stepping into Um, okay, I can answer that question. Yeah, so it, it is actually very, I mean, there are a lot of problems in this world that, um, that are daunting. And, um, and I think one thing that was very important for the class was actually, you know, I, for me personally, I, I never thought I'd be doing this uh, when I enrolled at Stanford. I, I, I knew I wanted to make some positive impact in this world, but I didn't know what that would be. And that's why I, I really like this class, because it combined other people uh, together. And that's one thing uh, for advice to do is to really kind of surround yourself by people who share that similar passion. And, it, and you're smart and you're very confident, so you can probably come up with something and figure out what that, what that need or what that interest is. Um, so, so luckily, yeah, at Stanford I met with Jane and the two other co-founders. Um, and, and yeah, and, and none of us had any clue about it, but it kind of narrowed down that scope uh, from the class. And we realized that, yeah, this is something that we are very passionate about, we're interested in, and then we kind of went forward to, to doing that. Um, so yeah, I would, do, I would do that and then just try a lot of different things. Um, I come from the startup world, start world myself, um, so I used to do software before this, completely different from like a physical product. Uh, but we used to uh, brainstorm all the time and come up with hundreds of ideas, um, kind of play with them a little bit. Luckily software is a little bit easier to kind of uh, throw out an idea faster. But we would always uh, you know, brainstorm and it takes time and it, it won't come to you immediately um, and, and it might take several months, but if you continue to just stick through it, um, eventually you find something that you're very passionate about. Yeah, and I think that's the most important thing is finding what you're passionate about uh, and then really taking the risk, taking the dive and, and pursuing that with all of your heart. And that doesn't mean necessarily starting your own company. It, mean, it could mean joining someone else. There's plenty of great ventures out there, so it could mean joining someone else, getting experience there, doing something on your own later. And innovation comes in many forms. It's not just about product innovation, but process innovation, business innovation that can happen within an organization. So I encourage you to think about it from that perspective as well. Thank you. Um, so first, I think I'm going to have to work to bring a, a version of the extreme affordability course for now. <laughs> I think it's something we might need. Um, but I want to ask you more broadly about the role that technology plays in uh, solving global problems, and then also how do we implement that technology? And just, you know, how did you go about implementing um, your piece and what lessons we can learn from that as we implement other technology? I think technology is a great thing. I mean, there's a lot of good we can do with it, and the challenge is often getting it to the people who need it. So I just want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. So we often say internally, we've developed this technology, but that's perhaps 1% of the solution. The real problem is how do you effectively deliver these technologies to people? Um, and how do you think about it beyond just the technology and more around the outcome? Because the outcome we're trying to influence, effect here is infant mortality, right? It's not about selling or getting a technology out there. It's how do we reduce the, um, the death rates of these infants. And so that's where creating a whole ecosystem around the technology becomes very important and providing the education, the training to nurses, doctors, and so on. So you're absolutely right. I think the dissemination is really important. And there, the way we think about distribution, we don't know what's going to work. You know, in most of these countries, uh, medical device companies haven't distributed to these, these very rural areas. And so even there, we take a very experimental approach. Uh, we do, uh, this is more relevant for software testing, but we do A-B testing where we go to one village, we try one set of distribution tools or, or awareness raising tools, we go to another village, we try something totally different, we collect tons of data, and then we assess you know, which, which is working better, and we keep refining our strategy along the way. So I think what's most important in trying to you know, solve um, problems out there that haven't been solved is, is that uh, notion, that culture of experimentation. Uh, just to add, so, um, 
So just to go on the technology, this technology actually, this, this, this PCM is actually very, very old technology. It's not something that we, we spent time in the lab and wrote a paper on. It actually was used to warm cell phone towers and different things like that. It's been around for 50 years or so. Um, and so one thing is, one, my point is, um, yeah, you can invent new technology, and I think there's a place for that, like such as mobile technology and mobile health uh, technology is becoming very uh, prevalent and actually very effective. But you can also uh, rethink existing technologies, right? So what, what led us to this actually was we needed something that didn't require electricity that could prov uh, provide heat. Um, and, and this was actually used to uh, incubate vaccines uh, as they travel long periods of time because they're very specific, uh, these vaccines. So we thought about it and said, well, if it's being used to incubate vaccines, why not be uh, used to incubate babies? So it's something that is very, very uh, old, but it's just thought of in a new light. So there's many things you can do, and you don't have to be a, a PhD candidate or something like that to, to come up with these technologies. hardly call it smooth sailing. Um, <laughs> I often laugh that uh, whenever I need comic relief, I read our first business plan where it says, we're going to launch the product in three months, we're going to have global domination in six months, and it's only going to take two people to do this. And now, 70 people later, um, three years later, we've just started the journey. So there have definitely been setbacks along the way, but I think the, the key mark of um, an entrepreneur, and perhaps even more so of a social entrepreneur, is you always believe the impossible is possible, and you just never take no for an answer. So as many times as we fell down, we got up, and we just kept going. We didn't let anything get in our way. Yeah, this, um, I mean, just to reiterate what Jane was saying, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. There was a lot of challenges. There was a lot of problems that we faced. I remember, uh, I remember this one, this is going to sound very hippie too, but there's this one time where we, we couldn't solve a problem. That we, we were making a prototype, but we didn't know which direction to go, or there's all these different things. So we actually all climbed, we, we left the lab, and we all climbed up a tree and just sat in the tree and just talked things out. And I still remember that moment with our other co-founder. And it actually really helped. Like, we came up uh, with, a, with a solution, and then we came down the tree and then started prototyping. So um, <laughs> my point is that it, it really, like, is Jane and I here today, but there's actually two other co-founders that really helped. Um, and, and these are really, really big problems. And I couldn't have done it without my other co-founders. And they lend the support. They lend the sort of the drive. Um, and, and there's no way uh, I, could, I could have got this far without them. And so I think that the key thing is that uh, with big, challenging problems, you need to really find, again, the people that will share that same passion, that will keep motivating you to continue on um, and to make you believe, too, because there's a lot of times that I get a little, a little sad and, or a little stressed. And if you don't have those other people, then uh, you might quit. And so it's, it's, it's that teamwork, that team effort that really um, carries us through. <laughs> now, you mentioned that uh, when you sell one of the embraces to a country that, or well, to a hospital that can afford to buy it, a certain amount gets put into the nonprofit. Uh, now, how much is it that gets put into the nonprofit? And at the same exact time, how much are you selling them for? And how much is like the manufacturing cost itself for the product? Yeah. Should be a VC. You should be a venture yeah. capitalist. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the retail price of the product today, we have two versions, one that sits in a hospital setting and one that sits in a home setting. And there's different business models within this as well. Um, but the one that sits in a hospital setting that uses a short burst of electricity, that one retails a little over $200. And the one that uh, is used in a home setting that uses purely hot water retails at about $70. Um, and again, these products are entirely reusable, so the cost per baby is, is very low. Um, and within this, we're experimenting with different business models, so looking at a rental model. Can a doctor or even a midwife uh, carry this with her and rent it from household to household? Um, and in terms of the royalty, it's a, it's a small percentage for every product sold that gets um, given, is given back to the nonprofit.
What happened to the other two founders? <laughs> well, so actually, um, is one's in India right now. So there, we're, we all are based in India. Um, so they're there, uh, but actually, it's really funny. They're coming back uh, for to the U.S. actually for the Tech Awards, um, the, also this week. So uh, we're all still together, and uh, hopefully, we'll have a little reunion soon. Yeah, but it's it's a really fun team. It's a diverse team. The other two co-founders, one's an aerospace engineer, the other's a PhD in electrical engineering. Uh, and so, what they're doing now, what all of us are doing now, is nothing really much to do with what we study, but it's just something we all felt very passionately about. Yeah, uh, I think it started as we, um, you know, we knew we were sitting on a good idea. We knew if we weren't going to take it forward, no one else was going to. Um, but all of us were still in school at the time. We didn't know how we were going to do it. So we started applying to different business plan competitions. Um, I think we won, you know, a couple thousand dollars as the first one. And then for a whole year, we didn't win any of these competitions. Uh, but we kept plugging away at it uh, until one day we won this prize. It's um, from the it's like Echoing Green Fellowship, and it requires that you be committed to the project for two years. And so at that time, the four of us sat together and we said, "Hey, if we're going to do this, you know, it's at least a two-year commitment." And I think that's when things really got serious, and we decided to to take the leap forward. Um, but one by one, uh, you know, all of us started doing it full time, and we always laugh about the early days of this, where you know, Linus and I used Starbucks as our office. We'd bring a long extension cord and a portable printer with us, and then anytime we had conference calls, we'd run and take them from my car. It was our little conference room. <laughs> I think there's a question way back there. Sure. It's an interesting question because as we first went out to India, uh, a question we got was, you know, babies are dying in such vast numbers, it happens all the time, do people even care? Do women even care? And um, I didn't believe that was true, but it planted this seed in my head and I wondered if that was the case. But as I said, over the last three years, if I, as I've traveled across the length and breadth of India talking to these mothers, it's become abundantly clear to me that these mothers will do anything to save their children. And that intent is very important because the power of technology, technology can only be effective with intent and it can only be multiplied if that intent is there and it clearly is and so I think that is going to be the enabler for us to make this huge social impact um, but with regards to you know women's empowerment specifically I think a part of this comes back to the education piece it's not enough to just provide the technology but to educate um, these communities that it is not the mother's fault and to um, provide things like nutrition um, and things that help prevent these low birth weight or premature births um, from happening. So that definitely is being incorporated into the work we do today. Uh, and part of this, you know, Sujata, for example, she is, is a wonderful example of a woman who, despite having lost all three of her babies, she uses that experience to educate other women in her community. And so Embrace has employed Sujata so she can be a community advocate to bring awareness um, and, and create tools, co-create tools with women in her village that we can then more broadly disseminate. We never want to take the attitude we know best. We really want to um, integrate ourselves in these communities and take ideas from local people that we then help to distribute. <laughs> 